Good morning. Uh, welcome to another exciting episode of Physics 1520. Uh, please do remember to type your name in chat for attendance. <clears throat> um, the background you're seeing will make, I think, more sense after today's class because we're going to be talking about Gauss's law. Today's topic, uh, the topic for this week is actually patterns of electric and magnetic field in space. So today we're talking about patterns of field in space. Uh, this is something you actually already know a lot about because we've explored the patterns of electric and magnetic field made by various different configurations of charges. And what we're gonna do in this week is try to quantify that in an interesting and rather formal mathematical way that's different from what we've done up to now. Uh, we're gonna be talking about two equations that are called Gauss's law and Ampere's law, which describe in a different mathematical way the relationship between patterns of field in space and the charge distributions that make those patterns. Um, the reason we're going to do this, this is something that physicists love. It's, it's, it's elegant and uh, it involves a new kind of reasoning often, a reasoning by symmetry of the situation. That's something that probably isn't familiar to most people. So we'll explore that a little bit. Um, but the reason we're going to do it is that we need these formulations in order to move forward to the last really big topic uh, in the course, which is electromagnetic radiation, a classical model of what we call light. Um, so uh, what we're going to do is kind of reason backwards. Instead of deducing patterns of field uh, from a charge distribution, we're going to deduce a charge distribution from patterns of field. And then we're going to express that mathematically in a way that we can, we can quantify. So that's the plan for today. And um, I am going to do an experiment here where I switch video cameras so that it's possible that when I share my screen you will see something other than the ceiling. Yeah, I think that actually worked. Okay, so here's the basic idea. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, we're going to chat. Where's chat? Um, we're going to make um, an imaginary. Uh, box in space and I'm trying to bring up the chat window here and I don't know there it is it's hiding behind my other window okay so can you see the uh, the vPython program on the screen yes okay so what we have here is a visualization of an imaginary box that we've created in space. And the thing about this box is that it's, even though it's not made of any real material, it's, it's just an imaginary mathematical construct, it's opaque so we can't see what's inside it. But what we can do is go around and measure the electric field at locations on the surface of this box. So here's what we've done here. We've gone around and we've measured the electric field at locations all over the surface of this imaginary box. 
Um, now, the question is, can we figure out what's inside the box just from looking at that pattern of electric field on the surface of our mathematically constructed box? So take a minute to think about it and then uh, type in chat what you think is inside the box. Okay, so people are saying positive charges, positive charges, proton, more than one positive charge. Okay, so you all guessed reasonably that it's, that there's got to be positive charge inside this box. Now, and that's because of the direction and the pattern of electric field on the surface of the box. Now we can make the box uh, transparent temporarily and we see indeed there are three positive charges inside the box. Not quite the right pattern of field for just one. So that's a good, those of, yeah, those of you who guessed more than one positive charge are right on there. Okay, so just from that pattern of electric field, you were able to guess what's inside the box. So let's try a different observation. We go somewhere else in space, we draw, we construct our imaginary opaque box. We measure the electric field at locations on the surface. And for once, we're actually drawing the electric field with the tip of the field at the observation location instead of the tail, because if we drew the tails, the arrows would be inside the box and we wouldn't see them. So, we observe this pattern of electric field on the surface of our box. So think about it. What do you, what do you guess is inside this box? Right, electrons, negative charges, um, some number of negative charges. And, and indeed, if we make our box transparent, we can see that there are three negative charges represented by blue spheres in our conventions here that are indeed inside the box and they're responsible for making that pattern of electric field on the surface of the box. Okay, let's... Um, do something that's a little more interesting, a little harder. Here's our box at a different location in space. And now when we measure the electric field at the locations where the, the tails of the arrows are, we see this pattern of electric field. So what do you think is inside the box now? Okay, so we've got some interesting guesses. If we had negatively charged rings inside the box, wouldn't the field be pointing the other direction? So there could be Positive charges on both ends of the box, that's a little bit of a problem because we find that if we measure the electric field on the surface, but not exactly at the end, so here and here, here, the field is still pointing away. So, um, a dipole wouldn't to it because the dipole field would be pointing in the same direction on the axis. So if we say had a positive charge here and a negative charge here, we'd have a field this way here, but we'd also, we'd have a field to the right on the, on the left side too. So that won't do it. <clears throat> Rings is not a bad idea, Tristan, and we'll think about how we, <clears throat> how that could happen. <clears throat> But what really is going on here in this particular case is this. 
So we have a large positively charged plate. Now, not all of it is, well, okay. So not all of it is inside the box. So notice that uh, I didn't say that all the charge in the universe had to be inside the box. <clears throat> so indeed, if we had this big positively charged plate, you can see that it would make a field in this region very near the plate that's uniform in magnitude and points away from the plate. But the key answer to our question is that inside the box there is positive charge. Now it's only a piece of the plate, but that's okay. There's still positive charge inside the plate. So, so Paul's guess about a lot of positive charges um, was actually a pretty good one. So does that make sense? All right. So let's try something that's a little more challenging. So here's our box, and we make measurements of field all over the surface of the box. And we discover that everywhere we make measurements of the field, the field is pointing to the right. So whether it's on the right end of the box, on the front, on the top, on the left end, on the bottom, the field is always pointing to the right. Now, now that we're thinking that there can be charges that aren't in the box as well as charges in the box, um, so a di let's think if a dipole in the box would work. A dipole in the box would certainly account for the field on the axis, but wouldn't the field up here be pointing the other direction? Ah, okay, so now we're getting some pretty interesting guesses. So a guess that there's a, a positive plate to the left of the box here and a negative plate to the right of the box here or a positively charged ring to the left and a negatively charged ring to the right. Um, <clears throat> A capacitor that's the same as the positive and negatively charged plates. So, so that indeed, those indeed are are um, definitely possibilities that could make that distribution. What does that say about what's inside the box? So you're postulating a, a charged plate to the left and a charged plate to the right, for example, uh, positive rings to the left. Yeah, the, all the charges are outside, nothing's in the box because somehow the amount of field pointing in and the amount of field pointing out is the same. And you're exactly right. What we've got here are these, in this particular case, we have these two uh, charge plates. So it is a capacitor, positive on the left and negative on the right. And in the calculation, we're modeling them as, as point charges and nothing in the box. It is also the case, as some of you suggested, and this was a great suggestion, that this looks a lot like the electric field inside a current carrying wire, which we know can be made by gradients of rings of charge. So instead of this, it could easily have been positive rings getting less positive, less positive, neutral, negative, a little bit more negative, more negative, and they, could, they would still have all been outside the box. So indeed, you're absolutely right that, that nothing's in the box in this case. So we saw that when the electric field points out, it suggests a positive charge when it points in negative charge. Uh, here it was pointing out 
in an odd pattern, but that definitely suggested a positive charge. Here, it pointed both in and out, and there was nothing in the box. And so the goal here is to start trying to make this quantitative. Um, and uh, to do that, let's think about the things we were focusing on when we actually uh, made these very good guesses. So the first thing we focused on was the direction of the electric field on a particular piece of the surface, really all over the surface, but one piece of the surface. And so when it, when it pointed out, we thought there was positive charge inside the box. Um, still positive. When it is parallel to the surface, that suggests nothing in the box. And when it's pointing in, it suggested negative charge in the box. So one of the things we want to take into account in, um, in making a mathematical formulation of this is the direction of the electric field all over the box. The way we're going to do that is to on we're going to we're going to look at each piece of a surface one piece at a time. So we're only considering this end part of the surface now, and we would do the same thing for every piece of the surface. And what we're going to do is we're going to draw a vector um, that's a unit vector, and it points outward from the surface, not into it, but out. So this is, we're going to call this vector n hat. It's a unit normal vector, normal in the sense of perp perpendicular to a surface. Um, and it points out, and then we're going to consider the angle between this vector and the electric field. And think of some function that gives us a positive number if the electric field is in the same direction or even partly in the same direction as this uh, outward pointing normal. It gives us zero if the electric field is perpendicular to this outward pointing normal. And it gives us a negative number if the electric field is in the opposite direction from the outward pointing normal. So, so we want positive here and positive number could be the cosine of the angle between these two things because cosine of zero degrees is plus one. Uh, cosine of 90 degrees is zero and we wanted to get a zero here for this sign of our charge. And um, cosine of 180 degrees is negative one. And it is exactly, you're exactly right, it's a dot product. So it's what we want is the dot, we want the dot product of the electric field and this outward pointing unit normal vector on that particular surface. And so the dot product, which can we can evaluate the dot product also by taking a cosine of an angle. So those two things are completely consistent, right? So you're exactly right. We, we do want the dot product. So we're gonna want um, the dot product of, when we're, when we're looking at a particular surface, the piece of a surface, we're gonna want the dot product of the electric field and the outward pointing unit vector normal to the surface. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another thing to think about here, and that's the magnitude of the electric field. Because imagine that we want, um, we make measurements here in 
on this box and we get this pattern of electric field. So we say there's positive charge uh, on this box. And then we move somewhere else in space and we make using the same box, we get measurements where the magnitude of the electric field is larger. We need to take that into account because it implies that there's more positive charge inside the box. So what we want to do here is um, make sure that we've got the magnitude of the electric field. And that is captured by the dot product. If we have E dot N hat, then we get the magnitude of E, the magnitude of N hat is one times the cosine of the angle between them. So that part so far is good. So the dot product looks very promising, but there's one final thing we need to worry about. And that's actually the size of this box that we drew because we invented this box. It's just a mathematical construct. It's not, it's not a physical box. Um, and so here's our box. We make measurements of electric field all over it. The measurements of the electric field are fairly large. But suppose we stay in the same location, but instead of the box we've drawn here, we just drew a bigger box. Now, of course, the measurements of the electric field would be smaller because we're farther, each, each surface is farther away from the charges inside the box. Um, but there's still the same, the same charges inside the box, whether we have a small box with large measurements of electric field or a large box with smaller electric field. So in our mathematical expression, we want the dot product of electric field on each surface times the outward going normal unit normal vector on that surface. But we have to take into account the area of the surface. And so we probably want to multiply by the surface area of the box. So let's see here. I'm going to have to stop sharing because I want to switch windows to something I can write on. Okay. So let's see if we can. Um, actually write an equation. Oops. Get rid of that. <clears throat> write an equation that captures what we've just talked about here and the relationship of, so we're relating a pattern of field to source charges. So the first thing we wanted was um, the, so here's our box. Here is our uh, outward going normal vector, which we're going to call n hat. And here is our um, electric field. So we wanted the dot product of E dot N hat. Um, and we also wanted something about the size of the surface. So, so this is the angle and the magnitude, but we need to take into account the size of the surface. So 
if the the size of a piece of surface we're going to call it a delta A because it's a piece of the surface area of this box. Then probably what we want to do is just multiply these things together. And what we get is a thing called electric flux. And it's going to be the sum over a surface of E dot N hat times the area of that surface. It has going to have units of, um, this has units of volts per meter, and hat has no units of course. A has units of meters squared, so the, the units are going to be volt meter, and this quantity is called electric flux. Um, and so what we're eventually going to want to do is we're going to want to uh, add up the electric flux uh, over the surfaces, all the pieces of the surface of the entire box. So let's, um, let's do an example here. <clears throat> let's see if I can do this. Uh, yes, good. Okay. So here we have a piece of a piece of a surface. Now notice that knowing the electric field on one piece of a surface doesn't actually tell us much because there are lots of different patterns of charge that could make that electric field and, and some could be up here, some could be down there. So we need a closed surface, a complete enclosed surface, uh, hollow surface to give us information about charge. But just to practice calculating electric flux, let's see how we would do this here. So think for just a minute about how you would calculate the flux on this surface. What happened to my chat window? Okay, so Charles says 370 times 24. Uh, not exactly because we're not quite in SI units, but let's see how we got there. <coughs> So let's just use this equation. So we want E times N hat. Well, that would be the vector negative 230, 370, zero volts per meter dot. Now in this case, given our standard coordinate system where Y is up, X is to the right and Z is out. Um, this unit vector N hat would be just zero, one, zero. And that would give us a plus 370 volts per meter. And delta A is just the area of this uh, little box, which would be, I mean, this little square, which would be since that's six centimeters, it would be 0 0.06 meters times 0 0.04 meters, which is 0 0.0024 meters squared, maybe. And so the electric flux, which is E dot N hat delta A, is going to be uh, 370 volts per meter times 0.0024 meters squared. And that gives us something like 0.888 volt meters.
So does that make sense? Okay. Let's try one more. Okay, so here we have um, a situation where we've got a circular disk and the electric field, we have the magnitude of the electric field, we have the radius of this circular disk, and we have the angle theta here, um, from the horizontal. How are we going to calculate the electric flux on this disk shaped surface? Think for a second about how we're going to calculate um, the electric flux. <clears throat> Now notice that we, in both of these cases, um, the electric field is uniform all over the surface. If it weren't, we'd have to break the surface into smaller pieces and, and add up the flux on each little piece and then add it all up. Okay. Well, another way to evaluate the dot product is going to be um, uh, magnitude of E times the magnitude of N hat times cosine of some angle. Um, <clears throat> times, and then we want uh, pi r squared. So what is n hat in this case? n hat in this case, remember n hat is the unit vector perpendicular to the surface. And that's a key picture, key question here. So, so you ask, what is n hat? So how would we draw n hat here? Well, the surface is here, looks like the surface is in the, um, the yz plane, I mean the xy plane. So in fact, a vector perpendicular to this surface, we'd have to draw that way, right? So here n hat is going to be 0, 1, 0. The n hat matters because do we have the angle between, are we given the angle between n hat and E in this case or not? And the answer is we aren't <clears throat> because this angle theta is the angle between electric field and the surface, it's, but the angle we need here is this angle. Um, so we need the angle between the electric field and the unit normal vector. So what we really need here is not the angle theta that's given, but it's the angle 90 minus theta, because that's the angle between E and N hat. So what we want here for the electric flux is going to be 
600 volts per meter, that's the magnitude of, of, of E times one, which is the magnitude of N hat, times the cosine of 90 minus 25 degrees, times pi, times what is the radius, 0 0.03 meters squared. And if we work that all out, we get 0.717 volt meters. Questions about that? You could find the, so the question is, couldn't we find also find the components of the electric field using the angle given? Absolutely, you could end up, you if you chose to, you could write the electric field as a vector and then use the, the previous method to evaluate the dot product. So you have more than one way to do the math to get this answer. Now, um, the dot product, one, one way to think about a dot product is a, is a projection. So, so when we take, um, the dot product of E times N hat, what we're doing is getting the component of E in the direction of n hat. So we're, we're, it's as if we took, we shined a light over here and made a shadow of this E vector on a rod in the direction of n hat and we got the component of E that's, that's parallel to n hat. Um, <clears throat> So what we want, what we're adding up in this flux, so we're, we're, we're summing the component, of, the component of E parallel to N hat. Now, another way to think about this, which some people like because it's, it's, a, it's a geometric thing and some people hate because it's a geometric thing, is that you can think of this as, as, as this E dot N hat uh, delta A uh, as a projection of E onto N hat and then multiply by delta A. Alternatively, you can think of it as projecting delta A onto a, an area that's, that's, that's uh, perpendicular to E. So if we have something like um, E here and uh, N hat here, so what we do is we, we're getting a, the perpendicular component of E here but a different way of thinking about this is to think that we could be projecting the area itself. So if we have, uh, here's E, here's N hat. So what we're actually doing is uh, projecting this, this square piece of surface onto an area that is that is perpendicular to E. So this is so so what we, we did here is we got delta A perpendicular. So the the, the projection of the area, component of area that's perpendicular to E. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's another way of thinking about it. I think thinking about E perpendicular is easier, but 
there are times when it's useful to think about it that way. Now note that, as I mentioned briefly, uh, the electric field isn't necessarily always uniform over a surface. And so if we have a big surface and we have uh, electric field lakes like that and like that and like that, what we need to do is just divide this surface into smaller pieces over which we can approximate E is uniform and then, then add it up. So, okay, well, we still haven't gotten um, to a mathematical relationship between uh, the flux on the surface and the amount of charge inside, which is where we're going. So let's see what we need to do to get there. What we were looking at before is um, the flux on a closed surface. So, It encloses some volume. And it was that pattern of electric field that we related to, um, to the, uh, the total flux, the, the, the charge inside. So what we want is flux on a closed surface is going to be related to charge inside. And so what we would need to do in this case is we'd have to calculate the flux on this surface and the flux on that surface and the flux on this surface. We'd have to add up all the pieces of the surface to get the flux on a closed surface. And so, um, so what we do is we write this as a sum of E dot N hat delta A over a closed surface. And so that's the electric flux <clears throat> on a closed surface. And that, um, so most of what we're really going to be doing as we do these problems together is to, is to do this, where we're adding up flux over pieces of a surface where it's actually uniform. Mathematically, what this really goes to is a, an integral over a surface where we take these pieces of surface and make them smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so that can actually be written as a surface integral of E dot N hat, where with dA, the delta A goes to a dA. And uh, so this is a surface integral, which I don't think you have all seen in mathematics. Some of you have. <clears throat> and then we draw a circle here. And what that circle indicates is that this is on a closed surface. And remember, closed just means this, this hollow box that's of some shape or other that surrounds something. Um, so where we want to get to is that this flux on a closed surface is related to the charge inside. And so what we're going to what we're going to end up with is a formulation called Gauss's law which says that the the flux the sum of the flux over a closed surface
is equal to, if we add up all the charge inside the surface times some proportionality constant. Um, some constant, we'll call it K for now. And And our job is to figure out what this proportionality constant would be. So let's take a situation that we're really, really, really familiar with, which is a point charge. So here's our point charge. And in talking about Gauss's law, we, we always take into account the symmetry of the situation. And the symmetry is what's gonna make it whatever, and the, the way we take into account the symmetry is by drawing our surface in a shape that makes it easy to add up the flux on this surface. So if we drew a, 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 a cube shaped surface around this, this point charge, we could, but that doesn't actually make it easy to add up the flux and we're going to have all sorts of funny angles. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a spherical surface like a soap bubble around this, this point charge. Now notice that I'm of course drawing a 2D cross section through this point charge, this surface, right? Um, so this takes a, this takes into account the symmetry, what we know about the symmetry of the field of a, a point charge. The, the field is radially out. And in fact, now we can, if we put the point charge in the center of this thing, we know that the electric field here will point away from the point charge. And over here, it'll point like this. And up here, it'll point like this. And down here, it'll point like this, so it's always pointing radially out. And we also, interestingly, having taken the surface this way, we note that the unit normal vector n hat is also always going to point radially out. So if we take any little, little piece of the surface here, any little delta a, then our n hat also points radially out, whereas if we take another little piece of the surface down here, we've got n hat pointing out, and for this piece of the surface, n hat is that way. So we've cleverly chosen our surface in such a way that, that uh, on this surface, so everywhere on this surface, E is going to be parallel to N hat. So the angle between them is zero. So it's pretty easy, actually, to add up the net flux here. So the net electric flux. is going to be the sum over the entire, all these little pieces of surface, all these little delta A's. Well, um, if we actually had to do, um, so the question is, would this be easier in polar coordinates? And the answer is yes, if we were actually going to evaluate this uh, numerically, it would be easier in spherical coordinates. But we'll see in just a minute that we don't have to do very much work mathematically to evaluate this. Um, so, uh, so what we're going to do is, is, is let this go to the integral of e dot n hat dA, where all our dA's are really small. And notice that 
this this dot product e dot n hat is actually a constant over the surface because since e is always parallel um, to n hat then it's going to be equal to the magnitude of e times one which is the magnitude of n hat times the cosine of zero degrees. And so it's just going to be equal to the magnitude of E. And so we end up with um, this integral of E dot n hat dA goes to uh, the magnitude of E times just the integral of dA over the surface. And that's just the surface area of the sphere. So I don't know if you remember the surface area of the sphere. Uh, it's four pi r squared. So what we have here is that um, our flux, electro electric flux, is going to be equal to E times four pi r squared. Well, we actually know E. Um, so we can write this as the electric flux is equal to one over four pi epsilon zero q over r squared, that's our e, times a four, that's not a four, four pi r squared. So this is the integral of dA. And so we get that the electric flux is equal to, let's see, the fours cancel, the pi's cancel, the r squares cancel, and we get a q over epsilon zero. So it looks like from our formulation of Gauss's law up here, we said we wanted this, the flux over a closed surface to be proportional to the charge inside. We can now write Gauss's law as <clears throat> the, I'll write it, the, we'll just write the electric flux on a closed surface, which is equal to <clears throat> the sum of E dot N hat delta A over this closed surface. is equal to the charge inside divided by epsilon zero. So our proportionality constant is a one over epsilon zero. <clears throat> now, would this have worked for if, if Q was negative? Yes, it would have, because in that case, the electric field would have been pointing in and therefore, uh, the cosine of the angle would have been a negative one. And so we would have gotten a negative charge inside. So there's a couple other things. So questions about this. No, the proportionality constant, proportionality constant isn't equal to our flux, 
the proportionality constant was this one over epsilon zero here. So back up here, we wrote the total flux is equal to some proportionality constant times the charge inside. And now we know that this proportionality constant is equal to one over epsilon zero. So if we can add up the electric flux, so we go back to the boxes we looked at at the beginning, if we can add up the flux all over these boxes, then on a closed surface, we can divide, we can multiply by epsilon zero and we can get the charge inside the box. Now, there's a couple things that we need to establish to our satisfaction. Uh, we established that the sign of the charge didn't matter, but what about, um, the, what about the size of the surface? So issues, size of the surface. Um, the shape of the surface. And what about charges outside the box? Because in a way, this almost sounds like a violation of the superposition principle, because the electric field on the surface of this box, we saw even in our examples, um, could actually be due entirely to, to charges outside the box. So we could have had, you know, a positive, positive charge here and, whoops, sorry, positive is red. So we could have had positive charge here. We could have had negative charge here. Um, so, and there's still non-zero flux on this, so we better be sure the charges outside the box um, don't mess this up. And for this, we're going to go and look at a different vPython program. Uh, so we're going to look at program called Fields, uh, that's a, one of the Matter Interactions demo programs. And I think we may have looked at this, uh, this before a little bit. Um, what it allows us to do is put charges um, onto the screen and then we can drag a cursor around and see the field, we can leave footprints whatever. Okay. And so um, if we make put a negative charge, we get a, a different pattern of field here, a familiar one. So what we're going to do here is we're going in this argument to consider long charged rods that go in and out of the screen. So if I put this positive charge here. This is a positively charged rod that's coming out and hitting you in the nose and also going into the screen. And now what I can do is I can draw an oatmeal box shaped surface around this. So if I drag, what I'm doing is I'm creating a cylindrical surface around this charge. And as I drag, what the program is doing is calculating the electric field, multiplying by the surface area of that little piece of surface and adding it up to get the flux. And then it's displaying flux as that sort of olive colored fuzz. And if the flux is positive, the olive colored fuzz points away in the direction of E. Whereas if the flux is negative, the olive colored fuzz points in. Okay, so that's our. Now, does it matter how big I make, what the radius of this cylindrical surface is? Uh, where's my chat window? Okay. 
well, let's erase this measurement and we'll draw a surface with a smaller radius. We see that the flux is a lot bigger, but the surface area was smaller. And so a big flux times a small surface area gave us the same answer as a smaller flux, but a bigger surface area. So that's that, that integral of dA and then. Now notice that it also doesn't matter where inside this surface our charge is, because if it's near the edge, we have a bigger flux over here, and but we have a proportionally smaller flux on the other side. So the sum still stays constant, even though the pattern of flux is actually changing. And what about charges outside? And, and let's, let's make sure it really adds up the net charge. So if we put a negatively charged rod inside also, it correctly calculates a net charge of zero inside our oatmeal box shaped surface because there's some positive flux over here, but there's some negative flux over here, and it adds up to zero. But what happens if we put a charge outside? Is that gonna screw things up? So here's a charge outside, and we see that it's still saying Q equals plus one. And it doesn't seem to matter where we put this charge outside, we're still getting the same result. So it must be that this is contributing a net of zero, but how does this work? It's easier to see if we take away the charge on the inside. And now we can see that a charge on the outside makes a large negative flux here. Remember flux going in is negative in this representation on a small fraction of the area, but then it makes a small positive flux on a much bigger fraction of the area. And so the net flux due to a charge inside, charge outside, sorry, ends up being zero, even though the charge outside absolutely does contribute to the net field on the surface of our, our imaginary box. Um, and so, uh, it's, we have to add, we have, in any one location, it makes a big difference in the flux, but if we add up the flux over the entire closed surface, then we end up uh, getting the right answer. Now there's a, uh, there's a geometric proof in the textbook that the shape of the surface doesn't really matter. But we can kind of see that qualitatively here. Let's use a negative charge for a change. Um, if we draw, if I attempt to draw a reasonably good circle, I get negative one. If I draw a really strange, strangely shaped surface, I still get negative one. Um, and you can imagine projecting all pieces of this surface onto a cylinder surrounding the charge here. So this actually works out okay. Uh, you can experiment with this program yourself. It's in the uh, example programs at glowscript.org. Okay. So let me go back to writing things. So um, there's one additional uh, aspect of Gauss's law that we should consider here. Um, 
so what if we uh, measured magnetic field on a box instead of electric field on a box? So here's our box shaped box. And suppose we measured magnetic field here and we found magnetic field uh, pointing out in a pattern like this or on a, a spherical surface we found magnetic field pointing out what would be what would what would have to be um, there are no cases where Gauss's law breaks down. Uh, Gauss's law is uh, Gauss's law is in fact um, actually more general than our equation for the electric field of a point charge because it turns out to be relativistically correct. If you if you make your surface smaller and smaller, then you can get to a place where relativistic delays are are uh, are, are, are non-existent. And so it's actually, Gauss's law is completely general. But suppose we, to get back to this, suppose we measured magnetic field, magnetic flux. Could we see a pattern of magnetic flux like this? What would have to be inside the, uh, inside this surface to produce a pattern of magnetic field? Uh, that look like this. It turns out you can't do it with four dipoles. So Patrick suggests four dipoles, but in fact, um, if we had uh, four magnetic dipoles, so Here's um, something like this. Uh, you would still end up, although you'd have field going out here, you'd still have field coming in here. So it couldn't work. The only way this could work is if the thing inside here was just a North Pole. <coughs> I mean, that was a good guess, actually, but, and as far as we know, there aren't any. Uh, so we have never observed what's called a magnetic monopole. That would be a, a North Pole by itself or a South Pole by itself. So as far as we know, there aren't any. Even a spinning electron is a dipole. And so what we think is that, in fact, we, ne we can't see that, that pattern of magnetic flux. And so what would be inside that box actually would be a Nobel Prize if you actually ever did observe it. And so Gauss's law for magnetism is that the magnetic flux, which is the sum of B dot N hat delta A over a closed surface must be zero. Well, so the question is, are magnetic monopoles impossible to create or have they just never been observed? And I think we, we don't know the answer to that. Um, there's, it's my understanding that in the, the, uh, the standard model and the grand theory of, of everything physicists are trying to construct, there's nothing that actually rules out for, for, uh, fundamental reasons, the existence of magnetic monopoles. And so, uh, I think all we can say is that we've never found one. And so... If we ever do, we'll have to revise Gauss's law for magnetism, but there are other ways in which this is 
consistent with what we observe. So we think this is probably true and there just aren't any, um, which is an interesting thing. Okay, so we've found here, what we found here is Gauss's law for magnetism and Gauss's law for electric charge. And what we'll do in recitation today is, is, work, uh, is work, some, work some problems related to applying Gauss's law and calculating uh, charges. And then next, in the next lecture, what we're going to do is apply Gauss's law uh, in, in a couple of different ways. One is to prove some things that we actually uh, asserted at the beginning of the semester, but never really proved. For example, that there's no excess charge in the surface of a conductor at equilibrium, that the the conductor has to be neutral on the inside and any excess charge has to be on the outside. Um, and also to think about some interesting cases like holes in conductors and charges in holes and things like that. So that's, that's our agenda for next time. We'll also introduce another law that relates patterns of field in space to, uh, to currents that'll be called Ampere's law. So that's our agenda for next time. Mm -hmm.